How do you release faith? Is you speak the word. How do you release faith in your life? You speak the word. I don't want to just be hearing it. I want to release it. I want to release it into my life. I, who told you you weren't righteous? Who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you that he wouldn't bless you coming and going? Who told you that he didn't justify you? Who told you that there hasn't been an exchange? It's all a lie of the enemy of the giving you the Holy Spirit that will lead and guide and let you know that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I've given you the Holy Spirit to tell you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I've given you the Holy Spirit that says you cannot fail if you're looking at me. just thank you for all your awesomeness and your greatness today. We thank you for a wonderful time to praise and to worship and to glorify you and to give you praise and glory, to come together and to testify and to, to hear the, the things that are happening over with Abraham and the, and, the, and the things that you've directed him to do. Father, we just come together today and I just, ask, I just thank you for the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide my lips, that, Father, that the things that are that are shared and the things that are said flow from the very from from the very throne of heaven to impact, change, and influence each and every person's world, the world that they live in, to see how good and how great Jesus is, and how good and great the Father is, and how good and great that they have the the gift of the Holy Spirit to to be empowered and to live each and every day and to make an impact in everything that they do in Jesus' name. And everyone said. Amen. Whew. Ever have about three different things, three different sermons, and you want the Holy Spirit to give you the right one? I think they're all right. You just have to have the one that's right for today. So how many heard of, how many heard of Saul? How many heard of David? How many know what David did to Goliath? He conquered it. And how many know that after that, was Saul, very, was Saul happy or upset? He became mad. He became upset. And how many know, how many know of Saul's son? He had a son. Anybody know his name? Jonathan. Jonathan was his name. And does anybody know anything about his, that Jonathan had a son? Anybody know his name? Mephizbosheth. How about we call him Bob today? <laughs> but he had a son. Anybody know what was wrong with his son? He was lame. He couldn't walk. How many know that, I'm going to ask you, we're going to back up and, and show you, we're going to go to 1 Samuel, chapter 20, and I'm going to share a few things about, about David and Jonathan that I think that will help us for today. We'll go to chapter 20, and I want you to go to, go to uh, verse 15. And as they're getting it ready, I'm just going to give you a little story. The story is, is, is Saul is out to kill David. He's out to kill David. He's done a great thing. He's, je he's upset. He's jealous. Whatever the point is, he's out to kill him. And his son, Jonathan, is trying to get him not to. He reminds him, Dad, do you not remember? This is the guy who, who killed in, the Philistines and set the Israelites free. But he still, Saul was out to take him out. And then David, we know, as we know David, well, in the middle of all this, Jonathan, how many here have ever watched movies when the king, when, when, when the king, you ever watch uh, a movie where everybody gets killed but the little boy and he grows up to take, to take out the family that took out his family? You ever watch any? We've never seen a movie like that. Well, the reason they would kill out all of that, that lineage or line, so that wouldn't take place, so nobody would come back and, and kill or take that lineage. So what was Jonathan, what was going on here? is that, that Jonathan was the one that was to inherit the throne to be the king. But God had done something different and anointed David as king, and Jonathan recognized that and was okay with that. There's a message just in that. Sometimes when God anoints somebody to do something, he needed to say, hey, you know what, it might have been, it might have been in, in my family lineage, but you know what, God said, you're the man for the job, so we're just going to trust God, and we're going to get behind you and do that. In the midst of all that, Jonathan was recognizing him as king, and he made a covenant with David to tell him that whatever goes on, I want you to, whatever happens that you and me, that you'll show kindness to my family. You'll show kindness to my family. And that's what I, what I just want you to read that conversation in, in verse 15. He says, but you shall not cut off your kindness for my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of his enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord, let the Lord require 
it at all of, of the hand of David's enemies. And now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him, and he loved him as he loved his own soul. So they, were, they had a, quite a relationship. And I want, you to see, I want you to see here that David and Jonathan, what happened? They made a covenant. They made an agreement. What was the agreement? That whatever happens to me and my dad, you're going to take care of my family. You're going to take care of my family. And then we know the story of the, what was that young man's name again, Lisa? Mephisbeth Chef. Bob. Now let's go to, now let's go take your Bible and go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And we're going to, we're going to jump ahead and see, and see David is now king. David is now in reign. And let's see what happens as he's, he's reading as, as this goes on. Verse, in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember that. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And when he had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And then King David then king said, is there not still someone in the house of Saul whom to I may show kindness, show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is, who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Emil in Lodabar. That sounds like dances with wolves, Lodabar. Then the king sent and brought him out of the house of Machar, the son of Emil, from Lodabar, which meant Lodabar there means barren and, and fruitless. So when Mish <laughs> the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and, and prostrated. Then David said, Mephizabeth, that's close. He answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, watch, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, 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 your father's sake. <laughs> you should be with me when I'm trying to read about myself. <laughs> I've already read it, pre-read. He had to be at home. I got my computer thing that gives me the right pronunciation. I keep hitting, keep hitting a button over again because I can say it right. I had a lot of fun all, all these years. And I keep remembering, how come when I was in school, I was good at English and good at, no, not English. What was that when they teach you how to talk? Grammar. I was really good at spelling and, and grammar. Now I'm all the time asking my wife how to spell something. Anyhow. And he said, do not fear. I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you the land of Saul, your grandfather, and shall, and shall eat bread at my table continually. And then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And I'm just going to stop there for a moment. And here's what I want you to see. Jonathan and David were in a covenant, in an agreement. And in that covenant and agreement, the agreement was, whatever my family is, whatever, my, whatever is going on with my family, that you will always continually show kindness to them. And what I want to back up, how does that apply to you and to me, to me today? God the Father and Jesus the, and Jesus the Savior, the Son on the cross of Calvary cut a covenant. Cut a covenant to always show kindness to, to you and to me for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. And we see here for Jonathan's sake, David, David uphold that which he had said. By, and if we read, he came and he was afraid because remember, the, the, here's where I'm going today. We need to break free from the prison of perception. The perception that God's out to get us, that God's going to run us over. And, and I've said, a lot, but break free how much he loves you. And we sing a song. He's a good, good father. When you begin to embrace that he's a good father and that he loves you and that he and that God the Father and G, they were in a covenant, in a covenant. Now, now Methizabeth, now let me ask, what did he do to get into that covenant? He was born into it, but he didn't do any. Of the, he didn't do anything, but it came to him. See, when you and I believe become born again believers in Christ Jesus, that covenant, that blessing, that kindness, that favor, those things, those things are automatically inherently given to you, given to you, given to you, not because of you, but for Christ's sake. God the Father honors it for Christ's sake, just as David honored Jonathan for Jonathan's sake. And it says that you will continually eat at my table. 
You'll continually eat at my table. You'll feast at my table as one of my sons. And we'll begin to break free from that perception that I'm not good enough. He doesn't love me. I'm unworthy. See, we need to stand on the strengths of who he's made us to be. Not the weaknesses of that perception of that mindset of what this and that. You have to stand on the strength that he's for me. He's not against me. In him, I'll live and move and have my being. He's the one that makes the way that I can have a relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that witnesses to us who we are in him. And when you begin to see that and walk and sit in that, how many here want to sit at the king's table? But how many have backed up with that perception and that prison that I'm nothing but a dead dog? See, when we begin to rub shoulders with who he says we are, instead of what everybody, you start rubbing shoulders with what he says, it'll change your world. It'll change your world. And see, here's what the, this is something that blew, my, blew me out of the water. Because of, and if we don't share this, if we don't share the perception how good God is, someone can have a perception that he's out to get him and they'll see themselves nothing more as a dead, dead dog. A dead dog. And here's, here's, here's a rabbit trail. That could be. And just like having these kids and bringing the kids and praying for them, they need to see they have a date with destiny. They need to see they need to occupy and be whatever it is that the Lord lets them to be. And let them shine bright in the world. It says in, it says in the Bible, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you and me the kingdom. The kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. Power, purpose, and potential. It's his good pleasure to give that to you. For Christ's sake. Because of Christ's sake. It's his good pleasure to give it to you. And just like David and Jonathan were in a relationship, in a covenant, it was David's good pleasure to give him. Now, we'll think of David. He could Remember I talked this little word analytical? He could have got all analytical. His granddaddy tried to kill me. His granddaddy had me live in a cave and run around and didn't have this and didn't have that. And I was the rightful heir and the rightful this and the rightful that. Even his, even his, even his son knew it. But here I was. What, what I'm trying to say is he could have, and, and Jonathan might not ever know what he did anything. But, but because of that relation, because of that covenant, it meant so much to him. He honored it all the way through that he found somebody to show kindness to. He found somebody to show kindness to you. And our good, good father, that's his desire. His, he wants to keep, because of, for Christ's sake, he wants to show kindness to you and to me. He wants to honor all that what he went through. And, you're, and you need to wake up. You know, last week we, uh, uh, we preached on that 2 Corinthians 2.14. It says, now. He leads us into, now thanks be to God. Everyone, don't shout it at once here. Now thanks be to God who leads us to triumph. But here's, when I was walking out the, walking out the door, a young lady, she said, I'd all, she said, my favorite part of that verse is the very first word, now. And boy, all week I've been dwelling on, because I went to the next work, thanks be to God, and thanks means his grace, everything that which he affords, but if you back up now, all that which God affords leads me to triumph in Christ. All that which he paid now. Because he's showing forth his kindness and his goodness in my life. I'm not a dead dog now. He affords everything so that I can live and he leads me in triumph in Christ Jesus' name. For Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. Isn't that awesome? I got so excited all week. Now I get up every day now. And when you begin to change that perception of to now instead of in the by and by, you see life differently. You see everything differently. You know, when you're reading Ephesians about putting on the armor, wherefore, wherefore unto you put on the whole armor of God. You start putting on that armor. You put it on with a different mindset. You don't put it on for, for defense. You put it on offense to go out and live life. You go out and live life and have the, you're empowered for victory. You're empowered to go forward. And the enemy is always, you know, I love the part where it says, it says the, 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 we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but the powers and principalities and all those. You know the word wrestle means? All the, wrestle, it doesn't mean fight. All he's trying to do is get you and me off course. All he's trying to do is get us off the mat and focus on being off the mat instead of being focused on who he is in me. That his, his, his desire is to show me goodness and kindness. His goodness and mercy shall follow me just on Sunday. Yeah, but, Christianity is not just church attendance. Christianity is a transformed life for an everyday life. An everyday life I can live victorious because of what he's done. Every day now he leads me. Now, thanks be to God. Now all that which he afforded and paid for, he leads me. He's given me to walk and to live in triumph. To triumph. To triumph. When we talk about wrestling, that, the word wrestler, it's just trying to knock us off course, knock us off whatever's going on and get our focus on all of the situations and the problems versus focus on he's already delivered me. 
See, I got news for you. I got news for you. The enemy is eternally defeated. When you start grabbing a hold of that perception that he's eternally defeated, he's got no hold on you. And it says that the wiles of the enemy, that means his tricks and his cunningness. He says when you begin to see his wiles and his tricks, they will no longer have a hold on you because you know who you are in Christ. And when you know who you are in Christ, it says you take up the word of God, you take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the word of God there, that's the rhema word, a fresh application for wherever I'm at today. I've got the word of God to show me how to live and walk and to do for Christ sake for Christ's sake he is he's made a covenant that we can walk and he's going to continually show you and me kindness how many get excited about that and it says that we'll understand when the wicked one you know the word wicked I used to just preach on Ephesians <laughs> but in Ephesians the wicked one that means pain turmoil disease it says when we take up the shield of faith take up that shield of faith We're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Whatever pain, whatever confusion, whatever annoyance that he had tried to send your way, it says you take up the shield of faith to quench, to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 6. In the word quench, how many like to get excited to neutralize? To render ineffective. See, when you start to change the pers- pers- that prison of perception of that, he, that, that all these things, he, if you think God's sending all these things for you, you haven't had a revelation how much he loves and cares for you. And now, thanks be to God, doesn't apply because now you're just begging for him to get you a breakthrough instead of realizing he's already done everything for you and he wants you to break out and to walk in what he's done for you. Not just keep begging him to do something. Start walking in what he's done. Start declaring what his word says. When you get up every day in, in, in the joy of the Lord, you've been put in right standing. You've been put in right standing with God's government. And because you put in right standing with God's government, that kindness, that goodness and kindness and mercy comes chasing you down. And it's already there. Isn't that exciting? That's life changing. But situations and things in life, when things are happening, it says, it says, I can trust in him, rely on him. And he says, he is my wisdom. He is my wisdom. He's, he's the one I trust. And what I'm trying to get to is that your victory, what I'm getting to, it starts from the inside out. When you begin to see that, that rhema word, it isn't just something you're going, oh, I, Lord, I hope you show, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. You get like Jesus, and when Jesus said, it is written, you stand up, that rhema word gets inside of you, it gets inside of you, it says, now, thanks be to God, who leads me to triumph in Christ Jesus. Now is the day, I'm going to rise up and give him glory. What's that verse that says, today's the day? No, I'm wrong one, but that's a good word, that's a good word. I'm trying to think. I got it right in my head. I just got to get to verse. Everybody doesn't know where I'm going. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it and be glad in it. There's tomorrows, and there's, but this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice, 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 rejoice. I will rejoice in his kindness and mercy are following me down. I will rejoice that I'm not a no dead dog. He doesn't see me as a dead dog. He sees me as a son and a daughter. And he says, if he says you will continually sit at my table and you did nothing but believe in the covenant that, I, that you did nothing but show up to my table. And I told you about the covenant. So either you're going to sit here or go back to the land of barren and fruitless or you're going to sit here and I'm going to bless you with everything I told Jonathan your dad I was going to do for you for Jonathan's sake I'm going to bless you for Christ's sake God says I'm going to bless you I'm going to watch over you I'm going to protect you and I'll never leave you or forsake you I've equipped you and empowered you to live life I've given you authority and power you're on the winning team you never lose when you're in me you never lose no matter your, your whatever the day is you still win in Jesus he is your deliverer when you start letting that rhema that Rhema is a Greek word for a fresh application of God's word in your life. And logos is just the written word. We just read it. When I'm just saying it was written, it was good. But when it becomes rhema, it, be, it becomes alive in you. It means something to you. It means something. You're not just saying it. All of a sudden, it's applying to who you are. It's making a difference in who I am. And when I grab a hold of that, it puts a, that hip in my hop, a kick in my step, that even when the pain it says, I've got, I, you know, he says in uh, Luke, Luke chapter 10, he says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. And I've given you power and authority over, over serpents and scorpions and over the ability of, this, of Satan. 
Woo! That's you and me. You have that power and authority because of Jesus. For Christ's sake, you have power and authority to be a life changer and an influence in this world. To be a bright light shining on a hill. Don't all shout at once. But we have to take, take you know, you look at Paul, you look, was it Peter in prison? When all them people, when it was it Peter or Paul, he got let out. Peter, and then he comes in, he knocks on the door, and they're praying for him to be delivered. And she runs back, hey, I thought I saw Peter out there, but I wasn't really sure. I think it's his spirit. He's standing at the door, that, that, there, but he has a word there. There's a word in there that talks about that God showed him that he no longer needed the validation of the Jewish people, that what God was doing in his life was enough. And he needed to trust in what God was doing, and he went out and preached to the world. And he was still doing that. But the point was, when you get to a point, you need to understand and grow. If you believe in Christ, he's validated you. He's validated you. And don't live in the precision. You know, I say this a lot, from the least to the greatest. You're all part of the eternal redemption of what Christ has done when you believe in Jesus. You become part of the eternal inheritance. That means it's not just for today. It goes on for eternity. And that, that redemption, eternal, I said this on Wednesday, eternal redemption he has for eternity redeemed you and bought you out to never go back. To never go back. He gave you an eternal redeeming life in Christ Jesus. For Christ's sake, he brought you back. What I'm trying to say is what Christ went through wasn't for nothing. And what Christ, and if the devil's not defeated, then, then Jesus never rose from the grave. The devil was defeated because Jesus rose from the grave, conquered sin and death for your sakes so that we could live empowered life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We could live that life knowing in that power that he has equipped me. He has equipped me to live a life, victorious life. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to take up the shield of faith, which is able to distinguish, knock out, quench all the fiery darts. Whatever that pain, whatever that struggle, whatever it is, you have faith in Jesus Christ to quench it, to not get in here. Oh, don't shout at once. How many here get anxious, get all worked up, get things going? It says, have no anxiety. Come before me with prayer and thanksgiving and make your supp make in supplication and make a request known to me. And it says, and the God of peace will garrison your heart and your mind. He wants to bring peace. He wants to guard your heart and your mind with peace. So when you get in anxiety, how many of you been? We, I know what anxiety, we've all been anxietyed up, and I'm not, if you have that says there's no, one of your strengths is there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Another strength is I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Another strength is he's equipped me with everything I need to live life and has given me authority over the enemy, and he has no place in my life. He's got no stronghold, no place. Because I don't, I tell, you know, we do all this time. It says to cast him out and keep on going. It doesn't say to stop and negotiate and talk about it. He says, cast him out. He's get rid of him and keep on going. I'm a child of God. I'm sitting at his table. I'm feeding from him. And you weren't invited here. See my signet ring? See my robes of righteousness? See my feet? They don't belong to you. I've been given the robes of righteousness, the robes of joy, and the robes of peace in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to walk in those things and apply those to my life. I'm going to apply those to my life because it's his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. It's his good pleasure that I could live with power, purpose, and potential in what he's done in my life. Boy, that make you all shout, get up tomorrow, and then you're gonna, whatever's going on, you can still look to him. Whatever's going on in your life, the wicked one, whatever that is, it says he gives you the ability and the power to trumpet. It gives you authority. And then the very next verse that says, put on the helmet of salvation. Put on that helmet because I think putting on the helmet of salvation because when we showed up, when we throw up that, this is analogy for me, but when we throw up the shield of faith, we see all those things coming. And when we see him coming, we go, oh. I'm holding up this shield and you're looking, maybe the shield doesn't seem as big to what all whatever's coming. But I'm here to tell you, it could be the size of a quarter on you. It's big enough. And what God wants you to do is put the helmet of salvation, cover your mind and that perception that it's not, and, and know that it is big enough. And as you put that on, I've given you power and authority. I've given it to you. I'm showing forth my kindness to you because of the covenant I've made with my son at Calvary. And you hold, that, hold, on, that, hold on to that helmet of salvation that says, and salvation is you're going to be safe and secure in me. You're going to be safe and secure. 
How many like being safe and secure? When all that's coming, no, nope, I'm in Christ. He's in me. I got the helmet of salvation, which means I am safe and secure in him. Enemy, you got no place, got no right. You are eternally defeated. You're not getting any joy, getting any peace. You're not robbing anything from me because my father freely gives it to me, and I'm not giving it to you. You can't have it. Kick him out of there. Don't negotiate. How many times do I negotiate? Don't negotiate. He's giving you... I got my little hat here. He's giving you the star of authority. He says, I'm giving you the star. And you need to rise up and say, Satan, you need to get up and say, Satan, you don't belong here. Bite the dust. Get out of town. Get out of Dodge. I've got the, I've got the hammer of righteous peace and joy, and I'm pulling the trigger. You don't apply. You don't have any right. Because, I, because God is showing forth his kindness in my life for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. That's your helmet of salvation right there. You need, to, you need to, whatever it looks like in your life, you need to shine forth it boldly and don't worry about what anybody else thinks. That's a transformed life. You're not worried about what everybody else thinks. I know who I am and who I believe. It's the word of God that's in me. I've got that fresh rhema word that I could live today. Amen? Amen. Woo! Whatever's coming my way. Mmm. Don't fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. What was restored to him? He didn't even know. He probably didn't even know it was even his. But you know, there's one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a statement here about. You don't like my helmet? Hey, in my cowboy days, I taught all just Casey's friends the other day with their hats. Let me see your hat. I can't do it with this one. This one. Boy, this is what I impressed Shauna with. This is what I impressed Shauna with. I took her hat, put her in, and I went like that. And she went, woo! <laughs> I trade you. But, but here's the point I want you to, here's the point I'm going to give you. One more point, and then we'll go home. We'll go out and live this out. That the covenant that was made was between Jonathan and David. Okay? And it says, you and me have been given the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile to the world that God's not mad at him, that God has come and sent his son so that we could live freely, have joy and peace, righteous and joy that comes from him. Now he leads us in triumph. We can declare that message to the world, to anyone that will believe that God loves them and God cares for them and they're, not any dead, they're no dead dogs. They are somebody to him and he cares for them and he wants to show forth his kindness. Amen. We've been given that. We're ambassadors to be representations of what he's done in our lives. And we can go out and share the world to that. In, 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 in Mephizabeth, as close as we're going to get, in Mephizabeth, when, when it was going on, when they'd heard that Saul and Jonathan had been killed, it said she went to grab him up. He was five years old. He went to pick him up, and then she went to, either she dropped him or fell on him, and that's what caused him not to walk anymore. Now, watch, watch where this is at. Watch her there. What would have been the difference if she'd have known the covenant that was between the two of them? Would she have gotten scared and maybe got up and run? What I'm trying to say, he might not have been crippled. Now, just, that just, just flow with me. And if we can share the gospel of peace and the, good, the goodness of who God is in people's life and share with them the covenant that's been established between God and the Father for our sake, for Christ's sakes, for us, we might, be, we might have a generation that grows up not crippled. They'll grow up uncrippled knowing that God is for me and not against me. I don't got to keep working for his approval, but he approved me in Jesus. Do you see where I'm going with that? What would have been a difference if she'd have known that? And I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, and sometimes in life, we need to share the goodness of the gospel, who Jesus is, what Christ has done, what God the Father, that, that he wants, you know, it says in Philippians, it says in Philippians to think on the things that are good and just and of good report and to have this stuff in you and, and to be always praying. What he's saying is don't let there be a communication breach because the world's never going to take a break on trying to get you off your mat. They're going to constantly be always pushing and shoving and doing and carrying. But you just have to get the strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Dude, I don't know what you're trying to do, but do you see this little funny hat? See this little star? You got no place to be here. You're not going to get into my heart. You're not going to get into my mind because I've given it to God and it says he's a garrison and the peace of God is guarding my heart and my mind. He's guarding my, my heart and my mind. That's his kindness that he's showing forth to you today. 
He wants you and me to live a life knowing that he leads you into triumph. When you get up today and things are going on, whatever it is in your work world, your business world, your relationship, whatever it is, he's leading me into triumph. Now. Now. You get up. Now is the day. For Christ's sake. He's chasing me down. Pouring out his goodness. Pouring out. And, and as you grow in that, you go, what was the verse I gave you last week? John 16, 33. In the world you'll have. But be of good cheer. I have overcome. What if we broke away from the prison of the tribulation side and broke over to what I said last week and lived on the side? Be of good cheer. Yeah. I have overcome the world. Yeah. I have overcome the world. Amen. I've overcome the world. What if we woke up every day with that mindset? I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. Cheer up. I've overcome the world. When Amy comes and the whatever it is, you just said, I ain't negotiating with you, buddy. I ain't negotiating. I don't got to do anything. And, and that wows and the wrestling, guess what? You've been eternally defeated. Eternally. And his biggest trick is to pr- try to show you, try to make you feel like it hasn't happened. Make you feel like God doesn't care. To make you feel, well, where's God at, didn't you? You know, remember I talked about the fire? It's not about the fire. It was never about the fire. Meshach said it was never about the fire. They knew they were in covenant with God and God was covering them. And they were going to be all right wherever, however it went out, they were going to be fine. Sometimes we need to get to that mindset instead of going, well, God, it just got a lot hotter. What are you going to do now? You need to back up and say, hey, you know what? I'm in covenant with God. I believed on his son, Jesus Christ, and it says I've been given all the spiritual blessings. Now I've been given all the spiritual blessings in Ephesians. Now he tells you that grace and peace be multiplied to me. Grace and peace. God's goodness and greatness. Let it be what it paid for to be in my life. I'm going, to, I'm going to let it be what it said. I'm going to have grace and peace that's going to guard my mind and my heart. Today is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. He is showing forth his kindness to me, me and my kids and my kids' kids. And when you start to embrace that, I'm telling you, you'll be at your workplace and people will just want to come talk to you because you're such, you're such alive because of the change that he's made in your life. It's not some, You're not trying to be a tree that bears fruit. You are a tree that bears fruit. You see the difference? You are a tree already equipped to bear fruit. You're hooked to the vine. That stuff's already running through you. I am bearing fruit. Not trying, I am. I'm not trying to squeeze it and get an apple and you're being an orange. You are already a tree established in him to bear fruit. Equipped to do good works. You got to show him the badge. Show him the badge. Don't live, don't live under the pressure but live under the anointing that it's already placed in you to live life. To live life and see good days in the land of the... In the land of the... Change that perception. Change that image. Change that perception. Take the chains off. Take the... Whatever that is, and and, and people here might know that. You know, I had... uh, uh, I'm, I'm done. Holy Spirit says I'm done. I really am. But I remember yesterday, we remember our, we had a young lady here, a young lady of 88 years old that went to be with the Lord. And I'll never forget, and I've told this story many times, her coming to me with her little finger, walking up, and she thought all her life that God was mad at her and God was out to get her. All the bad things that happened in her life, she thought God did it to her because she was never good enough. And the change came to her when she went, the, the change with her tears running down her eyes, we, we've been telling her how much that God is showing forth his kindness. God's not mad at you and God loves you. And she said, I wish somebody would have told me this a long time ago because she lived all her life where all the bad things happened. She came to church only trying to, to stay on God's good side. And we need to break that perception, change that, and say, he's a good, good father. He loves me. He's aware of me. He thinks, he, you know, you guys, we're, all, we're trying to rub shoulders with this person. That think you're rubbing shoulders with the man who created the universe and says, you can come eat at my table. I know your name. What was your day? Let's talk about it. You know, we're trying to do that. Let him, you, he knows your name, knows the hairs on your head. Think about that. When you, you're, no, you're somebody. You are somebody. You have power to be an influence and to change the world. People in here can, there's people in here that can change the world and change the world for people right around them. And if you keep getting beat, getting yourself get beat up that you're a dead dog, you're just going to, pretty soon, that's all you're going to think you are. Throw that out the window and embrace all that he has done for you, all that he's provided for you, all that he's done, 
all that he's done. Be set free from that perception and those bondages of whatever they are. You, if you're not in prison. It says you live, you live by the spirit of life. You've been set free from the law of sin and death. I live by the spirit of life. His life that was given for me. Woo, that should excite you. Maybe not. Excites me. Excites me. Excites me. Gives me that peace and that joy that, you know what? I am somebody to him. I don't know, man. I get all excited about that stuff. <laughs> that he loves me and he cares for me and I'm somebody to him. And that I don't have to try to show up and do all the, do all the, do all, all I got to do is show up and eat at his table. And he's glad that I showed up and he might say, hey, while you're here, you don't really need to wear that hat. They got the point. <laughs> you know? But be excited about you. I'm trying to get not just some charisma, but something that will transform and change your heart to live, live this out every day. What if we live that he's bigger than all of everything else? What if we grabbed a hold of that now? Thanks be to God who leads me to triumph today. Today, now, that rhema word. I've got the rhema word, fresh application of how much he cares for me, how much he loves me. I don't have to earn it. I just, I just got to thank him for it. Believe in Jesus. You know, this doesn't happen unless you're a believer. You know, you got to believe that Jesus says you got to believe with your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. You, when you believe that, you receive that transformed life. And as you grow, we're always being transformed, always being changed. An eternal inheritance, eternal redemption. Wow. I like that eternal and years ago, I remember we was talking, it's kind of like you, you find one room, the finder's another room. The finder's another room of all of God's goodness. When you start seeing that, is you just keep going, wow. You know, the angels go around. Every time they come around, they go, wow. See something new they hadn't seen before. Eternal redemption. Christ, the hope of glory, lives in me. Get anything out of that today? Yeah. All right. Let's, let's seal this up. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. As we go forward today, Lord, you know the hearts, the minds of each and every person. And Lord, as, as I just pray we just come together. We seal up. We seal this word in our hearts and our minds. That, Father, as we leave here, that because for Christ's sake, that you desire to show us kindness. You desire to show us mercy and favor. You desire to lavish and to love upon us and, and be part of not just a church service, but part of our everyday life, that we are the church. We are your people. And you say that you'll never leave us nor, for, nor forsake us. And Father, it is your will that we don't perish, but that we live life, an eternal life that starts the moment we said, I, I believe in you. And I just encourage you today, if you've never asked Jesus, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and be your Savior, when you begin, you just ask him, you say, Lord, I believe that, that you sent Jesus, that he died on the cross. He paid for all of the sins, everything that kept me from the Father. He paid and purchased completely, completely finished it so that I could take a watered down life and, and be, be made a new, brand new person. Father, I pray that if no one's ever done that, that this is the day that they say, this is the day that I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that Jesus died for me and that he's empowered me and equipped me to live a victorious life, empowered me to live life and shine bright, not just make it to the end, but shine bright all the way to the end. In Jesus' name. And everyone said...